Visual Studio 2010 is absolutely going to rock the world. We are going to deliver very high levels of productivity for you as a developer, no matter what platform you're going to choose to write your application against. Also, we are taking some huge steps forward in our application lifecycle management tools journey in terms of Visual Studio Team System and Team Foundation Server, whereby we are going to enable you and empower you to both do the right thing and do it right. Any uh, development shop has got a finite amount of resources and an infinite, almost seemingly infinite number of tasks. The key is to figure out like, you know, hey, which ones I'm going to prioritize, which tasks are going to give me the maximum you know, return on my investment, and how do I make sure that I allocate my resources to the right priorities? So that's what you know, helping you do the right thing is. Uh, Visual Studio 2010 is going to have a variety of, you know, or a number of groundbreaking features, okay? Uh, they're probably, you know, too much to sort of cover everything here, and I'm sure I don't remember all of them offhand, but I'll sort of give you a few here to sort of, you know, tell you what the flavor of those look like. At the IDE or the Integrated Development Environment level, we got a brand new shell that's built on top of Windows Presentation Foundation and a new editor that comes along with that. This editor, we think, you know, is going to do a lot of uh, what we call code-focused productivity features and enhancements so that if you as a developer are spending most of your day you know, dealing with code, we want you to be productive using this editor in this shell environment. So that's one thing that we are doing. The second thing is you know, the, there is a notion called test-driven development that is becoming more and more popular among developers. You know, Visual Studio 2010 provides you great support for test-driven development if that's a technique that you want to use in your development environment. From a programming languages perspective, we continue to give you a broad choice of programming languages. You know, we've always talked about, you know, achieving a certain level of language parity between VB and C Sharp. And I would say that the language parity that we are able to deliver with Visual Studio 2010 far exceeds what we've ever done so far. You know, if you're interested in doing functional programming, we now have first class support for a new programming language called F Sharp in Visual Studio 2010. You know, if you're interested in dynamic languages, we support that. If you're a C++ developer, we made you know, a number of enhancements to the IDE to provide better responsiveness for you as a C++ uh, developer. If you're a JavaScript developer, we provide better IntelliSense support. So across the board, we both increase the levels of support that we provide but we also provide you a broad choice so that you can decide what programming language you are comfortable with that you want to use, and we'll provide you a great environment in Visual Studio 2010. If you think about like some of the new platforms that are coming out of Microsoft, you know, it could be SharePoint Server, it could be you know, the cloud computing platform or the cloud service Windows Azure, we provide tools support for that in Visual Studio 2010. There is also a, a new trend that's happening which we call you know, parallel programming or parallel computing, particularly as you know, more and more machines come with multiple and many cores, we want to enable you as a developer to be able to take advantage of that. And we have a set of tools and library support in Visual Studio 2010 for that scenario. So this is all like, you know, for you as an individual developer. Now if you're working in a team, in the context of a team, software development team, uh, as part of our Visual Studio team system offering, we are we are giving you a lot of new tools in the testing space. You know, we made a ton of investments there, and we got a very comprehensive tools offering for the tester. You know, starting from you know manual, you know, or test case management, being able to deal with your manual tests, being able to do functional testing, load testing, stress testing, being able to do test case prioritization. We just have an end-to-end -end set of functionality in the test tool space. There is another functionality that we are providing in our Visual Studio Team System Suite, which we call, you know, think about it as a flight recorder, okay? You're running an application, you want to be able to capture the state of the application as you go along, so that in the case there is a problem, you run into a problem, the application crashes, or the application, you know, generates an exception or gets into some other kind of problem, rather than having to wait for the problem to be able to re be reproduced so that you can sort of get a feel for what is going on and then debug the problem, we capture the state of the application as you go through, so that we give you the state of the application and you can sort of you know, go back in time, you can walk through, debug the st as, as the state progresses uh, after the fact. So think about it as akin to you know, uh, flight recorder functionality that we are providing in Visual Studio Team System. So if you look across the breadth of what we are doing in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Team System, 
there are a number of you know, what I call groundbreaking features that are going to come in Visual Studio 2010. You know, if, if you think about you know, parallel programming, parallel computing, right? We've talked about parallel computing for the last you know, 40, 50 years in this industry. And even today, I would tell you that you know, parallel programming is restricted to an elite few people who have access to massively parallel processing systems. Now, with the advent of you know, multiple cores and many cores coming in you know, today's chips and today's computers, it makes it you know, a great opportunity for us to figure out how we are going to enable the broad developer base to be able to easily parallelize their application. You know, that's something that you know, we are taking the first few steps along that journey in Visual Studio 2010. You know, we've got support in libraries, we've got support in language extensions, we've got support in tools to be able to, to, to enable you as a developer to start taking the first steps in terms of figuring out how you can parallelize your application so that you take full advantage of the hardware capabilities that are coming in today's computers. That is you know, sort of one thing that we've been talked about, uh, that we've been talking about for a long time, but we are starting to finally you know, deliver some stuff in this time frame. You know, another example that comes to my mind is cloud computing or software and services. We, the world has been talking about you know, software services, is it software plus services, is it just services, is it software and services? We sort of think you know, the world is going to be software and services because there's still going to be software whether you run it you know, in your you know, environment or wherever you run it. And if you can marry that with the power of you know, cloud-based services, then you get the best of both worlds. So we've been talking about this for a while. And with Visual Studio 2010, for the first time, we are going to deliver tooling support inside you know, Visual Studio so that you as a developer, we want to make it easy for you to be able to build, debug, and more importantly, deploy your application to the cloud. So these are some of the things that we've talked about for a while, but we are starting to you know, deliver the first version of you know, tool support in Visual Studio 2010. So when, when we were working on uh, Visual Studio 2005, we sort of felt that you know, hey, we, our, our claim to fame is providing you with an integrated development environment you know, that delivers high levels of productivity. And we felt like you know, we had made enough progress that it was time for us to take a step back and think about, you know, hey, is there an opportunity for us to deliver a new editor that's going to make you that much more productive, right? And we started, you know, peeling off a few people at the end of Visual Studio 2005 and said, you know, hey, go think about what this looks like, you know, go do some prototyping, go do some early work kind of thing. And after, you know, a few years, we are at a point now where we are ready to deliver the first version of that editor as part of Visual Studio 2010. The other thing that you know, we started thinking about in the Visual Studio 2005 time frame, we, we really wanted to expand our focus from just the individual developer to people working in a software development team. That includes you know, developers, testers, architects, program managers, project managers, business analysts, you know, the whole crowd. We had started taking some baby steps towards you know, delivering a set of tools for the tester, but we really felt that you know, hey, there is an opportunity here for us to provide an end-to-end -end set of tools offering for the tester to ensure that the application that you're building is of very high quality. And we started working on that back in the 2005 time frame. And you know, we are, we've made enough progress now that I feel very good about the end-to-end -end offering that we're delivering in VS 2010. Visual Studio has been the most popular development tool with developers around the world for a long time now. And one of the main reasons is because we always you know, focus on developer productivity. If you are a developer, the thing that you care about the most is, you know, hey, I have a job to do. I have a task to do. I have a program to write. I have a software application to build, whatever it is, right? Now, please give me a set of tools, a development environment that is going to help me do what I need to do in the fastest, efficient, you know, optimal way. And we always focused on enabling uh, high levels of developer productivity and that has resonated really, really, really well with the developers around the world. The second thing we also said was, you know, hey, we are gonna give you one integrated environment, one tools experience, no matter what kind of a developer you are, no matter what kind of a programming language you wanna use, or no matter what kind of a platform you wanna target. So today, you, know, you may decide that, you know, hey, I'm writing a, a web application. Let me use JavaScript. Tomorrow you may decide, you know, hey, I'm going to write a rich client Windows application and I'm going to use either C Sharp or C++. Day after tomorrow you may decide that, you know, hey, I have to go do some work in this line of business application that's in VB 
So I need to do, right? The tooling experience, the development environment, the way you go about you know, building your project, it's all consistent across this, this broad spectrum of things that you want to do as a developer. So you, the mantra that I say is, you know, hey, you want to learn once and then be able to reuse your skills, your knowledge, your experience, no matter what you're going to do tomorrow, because fundamentally we have one integrated development environment. So between high levels of productivity and making sure that we have a consistent tooling experience, we think you know, those are some of the reasons why Visual Studio continues to be a very favorite tool among developers around the world. When you're thinking about a product like Visual Studio, which has got a large footprint, okay, a lot of engineers working together you know, from multiple teams to be able to deliver a set of functionality that needs to come together and work well together, planning for such a release is a very important task that we actually take it pretty seriously. <clears throat> I say there are sort of you know, two components to that. On the one hand, we, you know, me, my direct reports, you know, the, the management team uh, responsible for Visual Studio needs to think about, hey, what are the sets of you know, top-down guidance that we want to give to the team at the start of a planning process? You know, we'd look at like, you know, hey, what are customers telling us? What do they like about what we are doing? What do they not like about what we are doing? What would they like us to do more? We sort of look at you know, what the competition is doing. We look at you know, what customers are doing in the marketplace, and then we say, you know, hey, let's factor all of this into uh, our input. Uh, factor this as input into the planning process. So we look at all of this input. In addition, we also think about, like, you know, hey, what are the platform advances that we at Microsoft want to do? Right? You know, could be a client platform, could be a server platform, could be a device platform, could be a services platform. So between what our customers are telling us, uh, between what we are you know, hearing from the marketplace, from our, seeing what the competition is doing, looking at what the platform guys are talking about in terms of the next generation advances, we have a set of inputs that feed into us deciding, okay, here are the core themes that we want to focus on for the next version of the product. So that's some level of top-down guidance that we can give to the team. But then each team, they have the most knowledge about their particular customer base, about the particular area that they are responsible for. So we ask them to do some bottoms up plan. They also know how many resources they have allocated to them to be able to get work done for the next version of the product. So there is some top down guidance on the themes, the release framework and the like, some bottoms up planning about uh, the kinds of features that we want to do, and then we'll have to bring them together and make sure they meet together. I always say that for a product like Visual Studio, we have to take the right amount of time upfront doing the planning process and then know that as part of execution, We'll have to deliver on what we plan. The other thing to think about planning is, you know, we live in a dynamic world. You know, I may think today that, you know, hey, here is what the market is wanting from us, and then I start working on a product, and it may take me two years before I deliver the product. Two years is a fairly long time. Who knows what else is going to be changing, right? So we always have to be ready to be able to react to things that come from the left field, new things that show up kind of thing, right? To me, so as much as it is important to have a, a good plan up front, it's also important to think about what change management is going to look like. You don't want to change your plan every day. That won't work. But if something important is happening and you really think you need to change your plan, then be very thoughtful about how you do the change management because you literally have you know, thousands of engineers working on a product like Visual Studio. If, if I look at the next five to 10 years, I actually feel you know, uh, even more excited about what Visual Studio can do and where Visual Studio can go in terms of you know, a broad reach with the developer community around the world. Okay? Let me give you a, a couple examples. <clears throat> As I said before, we focus a lot on improving developer productivity. There is no reason why we can't aspire for a 10x increase in productivity over the next five to 10 years. At the end of the day, you as a developer, I really want you to focus on writing the code that only you can write, and not on anything else. If there is a piece of code that you don't need to write, that somebody else can write, then we should be able to figure out how we can you know, write that for you so that you don't have to spend your time on that. Right? So we always think about how we can raise what I call the semantic levels to make it easy for you as a developer to focus on the things that only you can do. It could be some validation logic or business logic or whatever it is that only you know what do you want to do, right? That's the only thing that we want you to do, and everything else we want to be able to make it easy for you to, to build around. 
So productivity and seeing a 10x improvement in productivity, that's sort of you know, one thing that I, that I always think about. Now the other thing is, today you know, if you are a developer and you want to you know, start building something, the first thing you need to do is go get Visual Studio box. You have to sort of go through an installation process. This is sort of you know, fundamental for you before you can even get started. Now, as we move into the software plus services world, imagine you, know, you are a developer. You get up today and say, you know, hey, I want to go write something. Right? Wouldn't it be nice if you, you know, go into the browser, click on a URL, and boom, there is a, you know, a, a development environment that you can get started with right then and there. So thinking about in the, as we make the transition or transformation from a software world to software plus services, thinking about what kind of online services that we could offer to you as a developer. That's another place where I see you know, us making some huge progress in the next five, seven years kind of thing. If, if I'm talking to a group of youngsters, let's say, who are you know, thinking about technology and are passionate about technology, I would say, follow your heart, follow your passion. You know, let, let, let me expand on what I mean by that. There is a, a, a worldwide programming contest called Imagine Cup that Microsoft you know, hosts every year. And we've been doing this for the last six or seven years now. The whole goal behind you know, doing this worldwide competition is to get students from around the world who are passionate about using technology to solve real world problems and giving them a chance to show their passion. Right? And I make it a point, I'm sort of very religious about attending the Imagine Cup finals every year. Because to me, you know, that's a great opportunity for me to get a chance to see, to interact with students and see their passion and their ideas show through, particularly in terms of using technology and software to solve real problems, right? I sort of get very energized when I go there, when I interact with the students kind of thing. The thing that, that I remind myself when I see that is, you know, hey, today's students are going to be tomorrow's leaders, either in small companies or businesses or in countries, right? And to be able to see and appreciate and nurture uh, an environment where peop these people can use technology and software uh, to be able to solve, you know, whether it's you know healthcare related issues or education related issues or you know, hey, you know, how can we make you know uh, the world a green world kind of issues, right? And there are a lot of you know global issues that people are grappling with today. Seeing how you can use software to apply to that, I think, is awesome. But it all comes back to whatever your heart tells you, whatever you're passionate about, follow that because then you're going to be able to do your very, very best. And if you don't follow your heart, don't follow your passion, sooner or later you won't have the energy to do your best. There, there, <laughs> there are a couple, a couple instances that come to my mind where we've made what I call you know, fundamental shifts to how we think about building tools and delivering tools to our customers. Let me sort of illustrate a couple that comes to my mind. The first one is you know, back in the 2000, 2001 time frame. Until then, we were sort of you know, merrily coming along like, you know, hey, we are going to build Visual Studio. You are a developer. We want to keep you very happy with Visual Studio and do all the right things for you. And we were sort of building and building and building kind of thing. And we sort of came to the realization, so to speak, that, you know, hey, the developer is still the most important person in a software development team. But guess what? More and more software development teams have other kinds of people beyond just beyond a developer. Right? As I mentioned before, you've got a tester, you've got a program manager, you've got an architect, you've got a business analyst. All these people need to come together to build the next generation applications. So wouldn't it be nice for us to expand our focus and say, in addition to focusing on you, the individual developer, what should we do in terms of focusing on the whole software team? Because the team needs to work together in a collaborative fashion to be able to you know, deliver on the application. So if we can provide a set of integrated tools that help the team come together and work together more collaboratively in a more optimal manner, we feel that we can deliver higher productivity value for the whole software development team in addition to the developer. So that was a sort of a, a, a fundamental shift and aha for us when we said, you know, hey, we are going to continue doing a great job with Visual Studio. Equally importantly, we are also going to start building something called Visual Studio Team System that caters towards the whole software development team. So that was sort of one thing that, that I can think about. The other thing is, uh, till about a, a few years ago, we were sort of the view that, you know, hey, we are going to have to deal with two sets of tools. A set of tools 
for the developers around the world, for our customers, and then a different set of tools for the development teams at Microsoft. And the reason we were thinking that way is, you know, we always felt that, like, you know, hey, the the scale sometimes is different. You know, some of the teams inside Microsoft, the scale, both in terms of the number of people working on a project, uh, or the complexity of the software that we are building, you know, could be different than what you know some of our customers may be experiencing. So we were sort of, you know, merrily thinking that, you know, hey, let's have two sets of tools, and then we came to the sort of the realization that, you know, hey, at the end of the day, a software team is a software team. Whether it's three people building a small application here or 3,000 people building a complicated application here, the kinds of attributes, the kinds of features and functionality that they need from a set of tools is the same. The scale may be different, but the fundamental capability is the same. So we said, you know, hey, we need to get to a world where we are going to build and sell to our customers what we use internally. And conversely, we are going to use internally for our development teams only what we deliver to our customers. So we have sort of you know, taken some good steps along the direction. There is still more you know, progress to be made here, but every day that goes by, every release that comes out, we are making more progress towards getting to that you know, world where we can say that we build what we use and we use what we build. So I've, you know, if you look at my career at Microsoft, I've been you know, uh, in the company for about uh, 20 plus years now. Right? The first 14, 15 years I was in Windows, and the last five years or little over five years in the developer division. And, and sometimes you know, people ask me, you know, hey, Windows is sort of you know, the flagship product for the company. You know, the, you know, it's been the flagship product. It is the flagship product. It hopefully will continue being the flagship product. Why do you want to leave Windows and do something else kind of thing, right? And I say, you know, hey, this company, Microsoft, right from day one, if you go back to 1975, when Bill started the company, his first product was a basic interpreter, was a language product, was a tool, right? Right from day one, we've always been thinking about Microsoft, about ourselves as a platform company. And when you sort of look at the world with that lens, through that lens of being a platform company, you really are saying that the most important audience for you is the developer audience. The reason Steve says, you know, developers, 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 because that's the most important audience for us as a platform company. Because for the platform to be successful, you really need developers excited about the platform, and the platform and the tools better enable developers to be highly, highly, highly successful on this platform. So I say, you know, hey, you know, if I get to be a part of a group that, you know, is responsible for winning the hearts and minds of developers, the most important customer segment for Microsoft, what better place to be than being sort of at the center of the universe? That's the reason I came to DevDev, and I'm excited that I'm here. <laughs> One of the things that I always think about is how best I could stay in touch with my customers on an ongoing basis. There are many different ways I can do that. You know, whenever I'm on the road particularly, I make it a point to spend a portion of my time interacting with customers. It could be enterprise developers, it could be you know, small you know, developers working in a smaller development shop, it could be meeting with you know, what I call developer influentials, could be MVPs or RDs or user group leaders, but somehow or other I sort of make, make sure that I get a chance to interact with people, both to share with them you know, what we are doing, you know, what we are thinking about, but more importantly to get feedback from them about you know, hey, what are we doing well, what are, what are the things where we could do a better job, what else should we be focusing on kind of thing, right? There is one other way that I also try to stay in touch with, with my customers, which is through blogs, blogging, okay? I sort of started blogging um, about four years ago, now, a little over four years ago now. And this, this is interesting because the first time I, I decided to, you know, hey, I'm gonna start blogging, I thought, you know, what should I blog about? I finally said, you know, let me make it simple. I'm just gonna tell the world that, you know, hey, I'm gonna start blogging. That was sort of the theme of my first blog post. And I still remember that I spent about four hours writing those few lines, just telling the world that I'm going to blog and here I am kind of thing, right? And the reason is because I was sort of agonizing over every word, every punctuation mark. I wanted to make, that, that was the first time I was writing something that wasn't going to get filtered and was going to go to the world at large for the rest of my lifetime at least. And that's sort of a different feeling, but a powerful thing because you get the opportunity to share your thoughts with the world at large. And likewise, 
You get an opportunity to hear from the world at large about you know, what you're doing or about your ideas or whatever it is, right? Uh, so knowing that you know, I can reach you know, a broad you know, set of my customers around the world, no matter where they are geographically situated, and knowing that, and particularly the developer audience, you know, one interesting attribute about them is, A, they are honest people, B, they keep us honest. So you know, they don't shy away from telling us you know, when, you know, hey, this may not be the right thing or this may not be the best thing you're doing, you know, why don't you think about this or why don't you do this? So we get a lot of constructive feedback and I love the feedback that I get from my customers. So blogging has been a, a great part of uh, how I stay in touch with my customers in addition to sort of meeting them face to face whenever I'm traveling. If you think about you know, the way, you know, it, go, it goes back to one of the things we talked about earlier. Software, we think, is going to fundamentally change. In some sense, it has already fundamentally changed, but you know, even looking ahead for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, there is the opportunity to use software and technology to be able to solve problems that are unsolved, that aren't solved today, right? And these are problems that have huge implications, global implications around the world. So it could be education, could be healthcare, you know, pick your favorite you know, uh, issue that you want to talk about, I can tell you how software can help you in that, okay? And guess what? Visual Studio is the tool that is being used by most developers around the world to build applications, to use software to be able to solve these problems. So in some sense, you know, this is the fundamental tool that people around the world are using today and hopefully will be using for the next 500 years to be able to solve these you know, big problems, these huge problems, these global problems. So in some sense, I feel really, really you know, uh, thrilled about the kinds of impact that we are able to make at the, with the world at large through the work that we do in Visual Studio and .NET Framework.